I knew this episode would be a mess when I saw that the showrunners wrote it because every episode they've written completely fails. They pay no attention to anything they've set up, their dialogue sounds forced, characters do things that make zero sense, and they seem more interested in writing big moments than actually earning any of them. For example, the episode opens with the dwarves. Gorin goes to confront his father who's using a battering ram to break through a wall in a cave. As you do. The showrunners really want these scenes with Doran and the king to be powerful, but like I've said before, we've barely spent any time with these characters. We have no real connection to them, no real understanding of their relationship, no reason to care about them. The showrunners spent eight episodes trying to make Doran and the king matter and failed. Meanwhile, in The Penguin, the show already managed to sell Oswald and his mother's relationship, and we're just two episodes in. How did that work while this failed? Simple. The Penguin took the time to show the relationship. We're talking maybe 10 or 15 minutes between both episodes, but because those scenes focused on the relationship, we understand their dynamic. We also understand what it means for Oz to bring Victor, his new driver, to see his mother. He's making himself vulnerable in a way he doesn't with anyone else, including Sophia Falcone. But J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay don't take the time to do this with Doran and the King. Instead of showing the dwarves' relationship, the showrunners unload tons of clunky dialogue that references things no one cares about. Doran says he'll cut his father's hand off if the King doesn't give up the ring. But when the King challenges Doran to do it, Doran backs down and shares some story about them arm wrestling. We're in the final episode of the season, dude. It's too late for this. That moment should have happened four episodes ago. You can't try to make their relationship seem important now when we've barely seen them interact for the whole season. Anyway, the king ignores Doran, breaks down the wall, and finds a cavern of Mithril and a Balrog. In fairness, the Balrog does look cool. They spent some money on this scene, and it was worth every penny. But that's not going to fix this mess of a scene. The king randomly decides to take the ring off and face the Balrog. Disa and Narvi hold Doran back as his father goes up in flames, which also blocks the path to the Mithril. Right, so why did King Doran take off the ring? There's nothing that happens to justify it. He just randomly does it. The same with attacking the Balrog. What does that do when he immediately gets dusted? What's stopping the Balrog from trying to find his way out? Are we supposed to believe it's going to remain trapped under the mountain for thousands of years while the dwarves keep digging for Mithril? That makes no sense, which is why in the book, the dwarves fled Khazad-dûm after they lost the battle against the Balrog. It then lived there by itself for about 500 years before the orcs moved in. The dwarves don't return until Bali tries to reclaim the mountain a few decades before the Fellowship go through Moria. The idea that a simple cave collapse would stop the Balrog is crazy, but the showrunners don't care about anything in the show making sense, which explains why they have the dwarves randomly show up to save the day in the Region, and then end the dwarf story with Doran with this nonsense about the dwarf lords wanting the rings and Doran's brother possibly fighting him for the throne. Tolkien never mentions Doran having the brother, but he does mention that Doran inherits his father's ring. You know, the one currently buried under fucking rubble? <laughs> Just, is he gonna go and get the ring, or will it spontaneously appear on his hand next season without any explanation? With this show, who knows? But one thing we do know is that this is Gandalf. For whatever reason, Payne and McKay desperately wanted people not to think this was Gandalf while making him look like Gandalf, talk like Gandalf, and act like Gandalf. This was obviously Gandalf, just like Halbrand was obviously Sauron, but the showrunners really thought people were too stupid to notice. And because it is this show, it does it in the dumbest way possible. Gandalf finds the Hobbit village and the Dark Wizard shows up. He claims Manwe, the head of the Balar, sent the five wizards to Middle-earth, but somehow Gandalf forgot who he was. We never get an explanation of how this happened, or where the other wizards are, or who the Dark Wizard might be. My guess is still Saruman. But that's not important, because the Dark Wizard wants Gandalf to join him. He has Xerxes' men bring out Nori and Poppy, and then turns on the men, killing one of them. The moment is so clunky that I can't tell if this was meant to trick Gandalf into thinking the Dark Wizard was against these men, or if the men actually turned on the Dark Wizard. I have no clue what's going on, other than that the showrunners have no idea how to set up a villain. This is the third time we see him, and he immediately gives away that he wants to take out Sauron so he and the wizards can rule the world. Okay, but 
Why does he want to rule the world? When did he turn evil? Xerxes' men mentioned that they were once kings before he showed up. What happened? These are simple questions to answer. A five-minute scene could handle this, but no. He's just a villain because. Okay, but for this moment to have any impact, we need to know the answer to at least one of those questions. Anyway, Gandalf refuses to join him, so the Dark Wizard goes full Ray Palpatine on the village, but Gandalf also has the Force and uses it to save the hobbits. The next day, the hobbits decide to leave, and Poppy gives a lame version of Sam's speech from Two Towers because Payne and McKay really want to remake The Lord of the Rings, but got stuck doing this instead. The hobbits call Gandalf Grand Elf, and that's how he remembers his name, despite that he's actually given the name Gandalf, or Wand Elf, by men in the book. Apparently, he was already called Wand Elf by the Valar, before he had a wand or a staff. Okay. Speaking of his staff, he just finds a stick that looks remarkably similar to the one from the films, and then goes back to Tom Bombadil and sits and sings Old Tom's story. Meanwhile, Nori and the hobbits go their own way. So, to recap, we spent 16 episodes across two seasons wasting time to find out that this is actually Gandalf, only for him to ditch the hobbits, stay with Tom Bombadil in the East, a place that in the book Gandalf says he's never even been. Mind you, Tolkien later revised the story of the wizards to say that the blue wizards might have arrived in the Second Age, and he always states that they went East. That change isn't in the appendices, which is the only thing Amazon has the rights to, but there's nothing stopping Payne and McKay from using the Blue Wizards, so they had an easy way out, but instead decided to fuck up Gandalf's history by putting him in the story, creating a host of new problems, the obvious one being that it wouldn't make any sense for him not to fight against Sauron. So now they have to either explain why he remains in the East when all hell breaks loose, or have him fight in a battle where he could easily turn the tide. And assuming the remaining three wizards haven't also turned, there's no reason they wouldn't help too. Sure, Radagast wouldn't be that helpful, but the Blue Wizards and Saruman were supposed to be powerful. This completely breaks the story because there's no way they wouldn't have a major impact on the battle against Sauron. This is probably why Tolkien didn't have any of the wizards in the battle. Why create this problem for yourself? Just because you want to use Gandalf? If that's what you wanted to do, remake The Lord of the Rings as a TV show. Don't create this half-assed fanfiction that completely breaks the story so that none of the events of The Lord of the Rings could even happen. Speaking of half-assed fanfiction, this shit with Numenor continues to be a fourth-rate Game of Thrones knockoff. The faithful get seized by Farazhan, who claims, after looking into the Palantir, that Queen Bee teamed up with Sauron. But why? The vision only showed Halbrand. It didn't connect Queen Muriel to Sauron, and the survivors of the battle would know this, and all of them aren't part of the faithful. None of this is explained. We don't even get a scene of Farazhan scheming. Nope. He just issues the decree, and then Aeorian goes to warn Elendil, who tries to convince Queen Bee to join him, but she's like, nah. And to answer my question from my previous review, oh yeah, they're definitely knocking boots. It makes zero sense why, but making sense isn't the showrunner's bag, baby. But copying other people's shit, oh, that's definitely their shtick. The Queen gives Elendil Narsil, and it's the same sword from the films. It's a touch smaller and the leather on the grip and scabbard is lighter, but otherwise, it's the same sword. So, the showrunners are trying to claim that this show connects to the films. That's the only reason to make the swords match. But if you watch this show and then try to watch Peter Jackson's films, none of this shit connects. Now, to the best of my knowledge, in the book, Ellen Deal just has the sword. I don't think Tolkien explains how he got it, but it's unlikely he got it from Muriel because he has nothing to do with her in the book. Anyway. Elendil flees west to find his son Anarion, which I think is the second time he's even mentioned in the series. Meanwhile, Queen Bee winds up in chains in front of Farazhan. Maybe this is where he forces her to marry him. That's what happens in the actual story. That's how Farazhan becomes king. But the show ignored that very Game of Thrones storyline in favor of... whatever this is supposed to be. Speaking of... whatever, back in Middle-earth, Isildur tries to take another man's wife. The girl he's been macking on shows up, perfectly fine after being chucked at a rock, and confesses her love of Isildur, so he says that she should come back with him to Numenor, and she agrees to ditch her man just like that. The show has time for this, but not time to explain how the hell Farazan's son winds up in Middle-earth. We didn't see him leave Numenor, we didn't see Farazan order him to go to Middle-earth, but here he is, peacocking around, being a douche to Theo and the Southlanders. Why is he here? 
inquiring minds would like to know. Isildur bumps into him, which catches dude off guard, but he refuses to let the girl on the ship, and her man finds out at that moment that she's ditching him. Then Farazan's son brags about Elendil being wanted for treason and threatens Isildur, and then that's it. He puts Isildur on the ship headed back to Numenor, and old girl gets stuck with a man. Nothing comes of this. It's like the showrunners went, oh, let's add some tension. You know what? Fuck it. Why even put it in the show if it lands like this? But nothing. Nothing compares to the hot garbage that is the rest of this episode. This is the worst adaptation, the worst fan fiction I have ever seen. Literally the worst. Worse than the Avatar The Last Airbender movie. Worse than the Dark Tower movie. Worse than the Dragon Ball movie. That thing is a goddamn masterpiece compared to this show. It's like Payne and McKay dumped all their worst tendencies into these scenes and no one had the courage to tell them that none of this shit works. For example, Strong Woman leads some elves out of Eregion directly into a pack of orcs. Now when I say this, you might think the show picks up when she's a few feet from the exit. Oh no, this bitch crosses the whole city and climbs a mountain only to get caught by orcs who must have watched her do it, otherwise it makes no sense why they're even there. And of course, in keeping true to being the dumbest woman in the world, Strong Woman agrees to turn herself and the Nine Rings over to Adar in exchange for the elves' safety. I will repeat that. Galadriel, the wisest of all the elves in Middle-earth, agrees to give the rings to Adar, her enemy, so the orcs will let the elves go. No. All kinds of no. It doesn't make any sense why she would do this. Even in the context to the show's mutilated version of Galadriel, this still makes no sense. At least she doesn't flat out say she has the rings, but she does hint at it. Meanwhile, we get the goofiest scene in the entire episode. Like I've said before, the showrunners screwed themselves when they changed the order of the creation of the rings, with the biggest problem being that Sauron now knows who has the rings, which defeats the purpose of him torturing Celebrimbor to get that information. So, Payne and McKay try to fix it by having Celebrimbor give the nine to Strong Woman, so now Sauron can torture and kill him. Okay, I mean, it's still a bastardization of the story, but it kind of works, which is why they decided to fuck that up too. How? By still trying and failing to make Sauron a sympathetic villain. I don't understand their obsession with this angle, but they will not let this go, even though it doesn't work because they did nothing to make Sauron sympathetic. In the first season, he's obviously scheming, so there's no reason to like him. In the second season, he's just a manipulative asshole, so there's still no reason to like him. They try playing this angle where he was tortured by Morgoth, but we never see that, we never see any effect of that, so that angle doesn't work either. No, instead they have Sauron go full J.D. Vance, pretending to give a shit about other people as he stabs Celebrimbor to death for having a function in brain. Sauron stands there crying crocodile tears, feeling so sad that he killed a person he didn't actually have to kill. Had Sauron maintained his bullshit Anatar routine, Celebrimbor the Gullible would have made the Nine Rings for Men and handed them over. The only reason this whole thing went to shit is because Sauron manipulated him, so why would anyone feel sorry for Sauron? Then the orcs show up and ask if he's Sauron and he gives his line, I have so many names, and that's it. In case the showrunners see this, the reason this attempt to make Sauron a sympathetic character didn't work is because you kept making him do really bad things. Just because he did them with tears in his eyes doesn't change that it's a bad thing. There's nothing tragic or sympathetic about someone choosing to hurt people and continuing to do it when they know it's wrong, especially when they're not sorry for doing it. It might make them a great VP pick for a pussy grabber, but it won't make them a likable person. And like I've said before, Sauron's actual story of wanting to create order in the world and being twisted by that desire is already interesting. The showrunners didn't need to change anything. Ironically, the show actually does have a sympathetic villain, Adar. Right from the start, he's a tragic figure because he's a corrupted elf. He's been tortured and changed by Morgoth, and it's not clear how much of his actions are his own. Is he pushed to do evil things because of the corruption, even if he doesn't want to do them? We see him try to be kind, but we also see him be ruthless. He seems to genuinely care about the orcs, even as he squanders their lives in battle. This is an interesting, conflicted, complex, tragic character who makes you feel pity, if not sympathy, for him. So what do they do? They kill him. The orcs bring Strong Woman to him, and she starts to offer the rings, but then he shows that he's got her ring. 
Somehow, the ring makes him a normal elf, and again, that's not how the rings work at all. And to show that complexity I mentioned before, Adar willingly gives up the ring he should have never had and promises to recall the orcs to Mordor if Strong Woman helps him kill Sauron. Even better, when Strong Woman asks how he can trust her after she's killed so many orcs, he forgives her. Just real quick, because I know some people might be confused. Forgiveness is a thing you do when you don't think a person is irredeemable, even when they deeply hurt you. That the bad guy is willing to forgive Strong Woman's trespasses is actually kind of clever. Gotta give it to him. But then I gotta take it right back because this whole scenario is fucking insane. Why does he even have the ring? What was the point if he was just gonna give it back? It's not like he was tempted by the ring. It's not like he was changed by the ring. Nothing is served by this scenario. If it doesn't make any sense or add anything, you should cut it from the story. Speaking of cuts, the orcs arrive with a wounded orc. This is the one with the baby who's gotten on everyone's nerves. Adar tries to comfort him, but then the orc stabs him, and the rest of the orcs give Adar the full Julius Caesar. Why are they killing him? No, 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 it's not that kind of show. They don't explain why things happen. No, the orcs kill him inside with Sauron, who randomly shows up, because. I mean, no explanation at all. They just switch sides, just like that. Then Strong Woman and Sauron fight, and this shit goes on for ten unbearable minutes. But before we get to that, Come with me to another scene, because it's a scene of special magnificence. Gilgalad and Elrond get captured, and Elrond tries to save Celebrimbor's work from being burned by trying to reason with orcs about knowledge and art. What the fuck are you doing? Not Elrond, the writers. Why would you write this? Elrond knows the orcs don't care about books. he never make this plea. This makes no sense. He's over here arguing with an orc who burns it anyway. Oh no, please don't wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. What the fuck? Is that a Rondir? He's alive? This nigga is still alive. How the fuck is he alive? I mean, I knew he would still be alive because he's black and they've already killed one black elf, but he's perfectly fine? How? He got ran through with a goddamn He-Man sword. How the hell is this nigga unscathed? He's not even limping or holding his side. He's just walking around perfectly fine. Even Elrond can't believe this. He's like, bruh, I saw you die. The dwarves show up and Elrond calls for Durin, but Durin's still at home and Elrond looks back like, for real, how's this nigga fine? No attempt to explain how this happened. They don't even try. The fuck? Anyway, back with Strong Woman in Sauron's fight, Sauron sees Ninya, so now he literally knows who has one of the Elven Rings, and this completes the desecration of Tolkien's work. Just pure vandalism. And it creates a major story problem leading into the Lord of the Rings, namely that when Sauron returns, why wouldn't he go to Lothlorien to get Galadriel's ring? Remember, of the 19 rings Celebrimbor created, the three elven rings were the ones Sauron most coveted. But he never knew who had them because Celebrimbor wouldn't give them up. That's actually why he kills Celebrimbor, not over the nine, but over the three. However, if Sauron knows Gladriel has one of the rings, then when he regains power in the Third Age, he'd just go and get it. He'd probably take it when the White Council faced him at Dol Guldur. He'd also be able to figure out who had at least one of the other two, because there's a place like Lothlorien seemingly stuck in time. Rivendell. So he would now know that Elrond had one of the rings too. Both locations are somewhat hidden, but they weren't entirely unknown, and Lothlorien comes under attack during the War of the Ring, so it would be likely that Sauron would attack them first to get two of the three while he sought the One Ring. There's no reason he wouldn't do any of this, so making this change is madness. Total madness. Just like this stupid-ass fight. They've got Sauron repeating Boromir's lines to Frodo. He's changing the shape a bunch of times. It goes on forever. They're so desperate to make Strong Woman look cool, but it just falls flat. The only decent moment is when Sauron points out that all of this is Strong Woman's fault, which is true. None of this would have happened if she wasn't the dumbest woman in the world. Speaking of dumb, Sauron stabs Strong Woman with Morgoth's crown, giving her the same wound in the same spot as Frodo. Honestly, if y'all just wanted to tell the Lord of the Rings, you should have told Amazon that and pushed them to make that show. Why make this lame-ass fanfiction? Nothing about this works. It's just a mess. For example, how does Sauron get the Nine Rings? Does he beat the shit out of the strong woman to get them? No. Does she mention them as a ploy for some lame-ass attack? No. Instead, 
They fall out of Strong Woman's shirt when he knocks her to the ground. That's it. No struggle, no search, just on the ground for the taking. And to prove how much the showrunners don't care, Sauron uses telepathy to try to convince Strong Woman to give up her ring, which she obviously can't do, so she decides to fall off the cliff instead. She survives this several hundred foot fall, but apparently the stab wound is what's killing her. <laughs> so, so, so wait, 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 wait. She would have walked off falling on a fucking rock at terminal velocity, but the stab whoop is just going to take her ass out. <laughs> I would have got up and walked away, but, you know, this, this fucking boom in my chest is just killing me. <laughs> like, this bitch falls from the height of the Sears Tower, walks it off, and she's like, oh, no, I've been stabbed. I'm going to die. <laughs> Why? Why in the fuck? Would you write this scene? It doesn't make any sense how this bitch is supposedly going to walk off falling from a fucking cliff, but it's the stab wound that's killing her. Get the fuck out of here. No. No. But speaking of dying, the orc with the baby tells Sauron that the dwarves are coming and tries to complain about the orcs getting killed. So Sauron stabs him and he dies. So I guess he wasn't one of those marginalized groups. But at least he's dead now, so people can stop complaining about having to care about an enemy. Incidentally, the Dark Wizard actually brings that up when Poppy calls him out for killing Xerxes' men. He's like, you care about this guy even though he was going to kill you? And she's like, yeah, because I'm not an amoral asshole. Anyway, Gilgalad tries using the ring to heal strong woman, but one doesn't work, so Elrond uses Ninya to help. Now, we don't actually see this happen. Oh no, it happens off screen. We also don't see how they wind up in what will eventually become Rivendell, or learn how the Elven Rings protect it, but that's what Elrond tells Strong Woman when she wakes up. Gilgalad says that the Elves are basically defeated, so he's trying to figure out if they should stand and fight or if they should retreat. Of course, Strong Woman says stand and fight, so she's learned nothing, and that's how the season ends. This was bad, so unbelievably bad, that of course there are tons of people claiming this was the best television show ever. One guy proclaimed that he was a diehard Tolkien fan and he couldn't understand how anyone didn't love this. Well, try not being full of shit and you might be able to see what I see because this is a mess. Just like the first season, the pacing for the first five episodes was glacial and then in the last three episodes they crammed in as much as possible while barely managing to explain anything as they danced on Tolkien's grave with this self-indulgent fan fiction. I give the actors credit for their performances because they were doing their best with very little to work with. The special effects were phenomenal this season. Top tier grade A effects. And for anyone who wants to claim that the effects suck, I've been following special effects since Movie Magic was on Discovery Channel. I know good VFX when I see them, and this show had them in spades. But that does not make up for the terrible writing. Even ignoring the showrunners masticating Tolkien's works and spitting them out, the show is internally inconsistent. The plot lines make no sense on their own, Characters either have no clear motivations or not enough time is given to fleshing out their motivations. The characters barely get enough time to develop, so we never get a chance to care about any of them. The writers want these grand moments but didn't do the work to build the scenes to earn those moments. I don't think the showrunners set out to make a bad show, but I do think they are oblivious to the fact that their show doesn't work. It's terribly written, it pulls way too much from Peter Jackson's films, it's obviously a half assed reimagining of The Lord of the Rings, and it comes across like J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay have no respect for Tolkien's work, let alone understand it. Now, like I said in my review of the last episode for season one, for those who like the show, you're welcome to like it, but that doesn't mean it's not bad. We've had eight episodes of some of the worst storytelling ever put on screen, again, after two years to fix it. The showrunners again failed to meet their own promises and again torched Tolkien's work in the process. And this is after the showrunners claimed that season two would be closer to the book. The showrunners knew they had a problem with the structure of the first season, but instead of fixing that, they doubled down on those mistakes and chose to again take a well-established history and mangle it beyond recognition. You are welcome to like this show, but that doesn't change what it is. It's internally inconsistent, with characters to have little or no depth, it leaves out tons of info the audience needs to know for things to make sense, the dialogue smacks of someone trying way too hard, 
and the pacing is still fucked up. You're free to ignore all that and enjoy what you see, but I will again ask people to be honest. If this show hadn't received criticism, would you actually like it? Would you think it was this masterpiece of storytelling? Be honest. Because that's what I've been doing. I'm not chilling for anybody. I'm definitely not going with the consensus. This is my honest opinion. The show sucks. And Amazon has proven they can't and won't fix it. And now it looks like Amazon is waiting to greenlight season 3. The Hollywood Reporter said that the show hasn't received the go for the next season. Amazon probably will greenlight it because they've invested a billion dollars into this thing and plan to have five seasons. It would be unprecedented for them to cancel a series after spending that much money. Now, last time, after I finished The Rings of Power, I watched The Lord of the Rings and the Appendices to cleanse my palate. But I'm in the middle of working on a story, and I can't have Tolkien's work influence in the story, so I can't dive back into that at the moment. But I can watch the shit out of other stuff, and since I just watched this horror show, I think I'm just going to watch a bunch of horror films to finish out the month. After all, none of them can be worse than this shit show. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.